With the invention of the internet, most people's lives changed. It got to the point where almost everyone I knew wanted to have a computer. A couple of years ago, we finally joined the computer generation and decided to buy one. At first, it was the new toy in the house. Deb, my wife, used it for email and games. The kids, Kyle and Kayla, used it for playing games and doing homework. I, on the other hand, used it for internet searches and pornography. I often stayed late at work. I worked the second shift and left the factory at midnight. I didn't want to go to bars like a lot of guys. After all, I was married. So I always headed home. Everyone was already asleep and I would sit down at the computer. After a while, the same old, same old got boring. I didn't really become addicted like a lot of people. I went to story websites and read stories about everything imaginable. I couldn't believe most of what I read. Do people really do these things or are they just fantasies? I was hooked by the stories of cheating wives. All these women were cheating on their husbands. It's hard to believe, but it suggested certain thoughts. So now I was kind of watching my wife's actions. When we went on dates, I would tell her about her dancing too close or being too nice to different guys. We even argued about it. I knew she was a good-looking woman, but I had no reason not to trust her. I found myself searching through the clothes hamper or going through our emails. So silly what comes to mind after reading these stories. I started reading less and less, but many thoughts still remained. I remember reading about men who caught their wife with another man and stood there looking at them. I had to ask myself the question, does it really turn you on when you catch your spouse with another man? I kept thinking about it, and given my jealousy, I didn't feel like it could turn me on. I told Deb about these thoughts, and she asked me why I was even thinking these things. She didn't want any other man but me. I met Deb when we were in our 20s. It was at her sister's wedding. We danced and became good friends after that. She told me she worked as a school teacher, and I told her what factory I worked in. We started dating and got married about a year later. The next year we had Kyle, and two years after that Kayla was born. Deb's sister Sandy was a wild girl I met years ago in high school. We didn't date, but she was a real slut. I guess I shouldn't say that, or I'll be considered a slut too. I was pretty wild back in the day too. She had sex with just about anyone. As far as I know, almost every guy on our soccer team was with her. I participated in a threesome after a game she was involved in. No one forced her, and she did it more than once. She and one of her girlfriends, Anne, had sex with almost everyone on demand. I knew her husband, Bob, from work. He was one of the day shift supervisors. He'd since been transferred to another plant. He was just as wild as Sandy. He was the one who invited me to their wedding. I didn't care for Bob too much because I knew what kind of man he was. I liked him even less when I decided he was trying to hit on Deb after our wedding. She told me she thought he was just being polite since he was our brother-in-law, but I knew better. I told her that if he tried to do anything to her, to let me know and I would kick his ass. She told me to calm down. She was mine and mine alone. We agreed to never talk about our past relationships because we were both pretty jealous people. I didn't want to go on a date one day and run into the guy she had mentioned having sex with. I also didn't want to explain to her that I had slept with her sister. When Kyle was eight and Kayla was six, they were both in school, and Deb and I got along pretty well, except for the fights we all have. We didn't see each other much since we worked different shifts. I was alone during the day and she was alone with the kids at night. It wasn't the best situation for a marriage, but that's the way it was. One day, while getting ready for work, Deb asked me if I could come over to her sister Sandy's house and fix the plumbing. Her kitchen sink was leaking and Bob was useless as a handyman. I laughed when she said the word plumbing, and she quickly replied, The plumbing is at the sink, not my sister's. If you ever try to fix it, you'll regret it. I told Deb that I would stop by on my way to work and fix everything before I went inside. She gave me a kiss and then headed off with the kids to school. I couldn't help but think about Sandy. From what Bob had told me, I realized that they were probably swingers. They didn't have kids because Sandy always said it would ruin her figure. She didn't have a bad figure, but no better than Deb, and Deb had two kids. Sandy was always trying to hit on me. I did my best to just joke around with her. She didn't look bad, but she wasn't worth losing your marriage over. I remember her telling me it would happen someday. Sandy was a part-time cashier at a local grocery store. It was her day off, and she knew I was coming to fix the plumbing. When I arrived, she was wearing a sexy bathrobe. She offered me a cup of coffee and we talked for a few minutes before she showed me the sink. I realized it was just clogged when I removed everything from under the sink to unclog the siphon. Her husband could probably fix it. He probably didn't even try. 
I lay on my back with my head under the cabinet and put the siphon back in place. She had put too many eggshells and potato peels down the garbage disposal, and they had clogged the drain. As I was putting everything back together, she stood up, leaning on me. What are you doing, Sandy? I want you. Stop it, Sandy! I'm trying to finish this job. She stepped back for a moment and I finished assembling the pipes. When I was done and stood up, Sandy asked, Are you going to sleep with me now? No, Sandy. I can't do that. Deb is your sister and I love her. I won't cheat on her, especially not with her sister. Have you forgotten how it was in high school? Are you too good to sleep with me now? Sandy, please. I love Deb. She doesn't know about our past together unless you tell her. You're a beautiful woman, but I love Deb. You stupid, stupid man. Either you'll sleep with me or I'll tell Deb you did it anyway. She'll believe me after all, I'm her sister. Why did you do this? Why hurt us? Deb is your sister and loves you. Sandy laughed. My little prude thinks she's a slut. Let's see how she reacts when I tell her about it. Sandy, don't do this. I won't have sex with you and I'll tell Deb about how we were in school. I know she'll understand. I grabbed my tools and told her I was done with her damn sink. I jumped in my truck and drove to work. My head was spinning. Would Sandy make up some story and lie to Deb? Arriving at work, I called Deb, but she wasn't home yet. I left a message. Deb, I love you and have something to tell you about your sister when I get home tonight. I got to work and got down to business. It was hard to concentrate with all this shit going through my head. It was starting to be a normal day like any other, but now it was all mixed up. Around six, I called home again, but no one answered. I called Deb's mom and asked if she knew where Deb was. She left with Sandy and Bob. The kids stayed with me. Deb asked if I could watch them for a few hours while they left. I said I'd leave them overnight. I like having them here. Is something wrong, Ray? No, it's okay. If you see her, tell her I love her and I'll see her tonight. I have to get back to work. For me, it was one of the longest nights of my life. I knew I had to tell Deb about me and her sister. Hell, that was before I even met Deb. I'm sure she would have understood. Finally, my day was over and I headed home. As I stopped in front of the house, I saw a car parked in the driveway. I knew it was Sandy's car. Apparently, it was time to face the truth. I went to open the door, but it was locked. I pulled the key out and couldn't believe what I saw. Sitting in the living room were my wife, Bob, and Sandy. Sandy was sitting on my couch holding Deb's hand. Bob was pulling up his pants and my beautiful wife was lying on the couch. Everyone flinched when I opened the door. There was a smile on Sandy's face and a smirk on Bob's face. My wife, Debbie, looked half scared and drunk. Now I had to face reality. I don't know about the guys in the stories I read, but I didn't have a boner. I didn't like seeing my wife in that position. I was beyond furious, ran up to Bob and hit him as hard as I could. I knocked him to the ground. Behind me, I heard screaming. I didn't know if it was Deb or Sandy. I hit Bob probably five times before I felt a blow to the back of my head. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. I looked back and saw a man in uniform. It must have been a city policeman. I see you're back in the world. I'm patrolman Gene Andrews. Where exactly am I and where is my wife? What happened to me? Slow down, Mr. Harper. You have a concussion from being hit on the head with a glass vase. Apparently, you got into a fight in your home and the police were called. They were going to charge you with assault, but the charges were dropped. You were very lucky. You could have gone to jail for a whole 18 months. What about the attack on me? You said someone hit me in the head. According to witnesses, you came home and started fighting with your brother-in-law. To make you stop, his wife hit you on the head with a vase. You were hit only once, and that was to stop the fight. You should thank them for dropping the charges against you. Where was my wife when you came in? When we arrived, your wife was throwing up. Your sister-in-law said she had too much to drink, and you got angry with her. And when you headed towards her, your son-in-law stopped you and you started fighting with him. He was only trying to defend himself. When we talked to your wife, she said she doesn't remember much except that you were yelling at her. If the charges are dropped, why are you here? My supervisor called when you weren't home yet and told me to wait and get your statement. So what happened? I have nothing to say. 
I wasn't going to tell the world that I caught my wife in bed with another man. I just lay there and didn't say anything. All right, have it your way. According to the doctor, you will have to stay here until tomorrow. I suggest you think about what you've done and thank God that no charges have been filed. You are a very lucky man, Mr. Harper. The officer left and I lay there with a terrible headache. What was I going to do next? I knew I couldn't live with a cheating wife, but I had to know why she was doing this. I called my sister to pick me up the next morning. I had no way to get home and I didn't want Debbie picking me up. While I was waiting for Amy, my sister, to arrive, the phone rang. It was Deb. Do you want me to come and get you? We need to talk now that we're even. Even? What the hell are you talking about? You slept with Bob and you're saying we're even. Amy's coming to get me. I just want to pick up a few of my things and I'm leaving. What do you mean leave? I was just getting even with you for what you did, Deb replied. I'm not going to talk about it over the phone. Amy and I will come get my stuff and we'll talk then. I hung up the phone and waited for Amy. She showed up a few minutes later and we headed toward my house. I asked Amy to wait in the car. I knew she liked Deb and I didn't want her to be in the middle of anything. I knocked on the door and Deb opened it. I asked where the kids were and she said they were still at her mom's. I spoke first. Did you get my message? Yes, and Sandy told me how you forced her to have sex. How could you do that? She cried softly. I didn't do anything like that. That's why I left the message. I went over to Sandy's house and fixed her plumbing. She started hitting on me. I told her no, but she kept insisting on doing it. She told me that she would tell you that she had sex with me, even though she didn't. I don't believe you. You're lying! Why would my sister lie to me? She's jealous of our marriage. She wanted to see if she could keep us apart, and she seems to have succeeded. Why do you think she sat back and let Bob have sex with you? They are swingers and wanted to get you into it. Looks like they both got what they wanted. You let Bob have sex with you and our marriage died. No, that's not true. I did it to get even with you. You raped my sister and I had sex with Bob to get even with you. Sandy even knew you weren't circumcised and that you had a mole on your upper thigh. Your sister is a whore. She knew that because I slept with her in high school like every other guy. I never told you because I had a crush on you and didn't want to lose you. Then you said we would never talk about our past relationship, so I left it all in the past. I don't know what to believe. Sandy is my sister. And I'm your husband. You didn't even wait to ask or call me about it. Instead, you let Bob do it. Do you really think it would have solved the problem if I had raped your sister? You must have wanted him very badly to let them talk you into it. But, Sandy said, I don't care what your whore sister said. This isn't just about Bob. It's about you not respecting me and not trusting me to at least listen to the accusations against me. If I raped her, why didn't she call the police? She said she didn't want to hurt me with a family scandal. She had no problem hitting me over the head and calling the police last night. She didn't yell rape because it didn't happen. You can believe whoever you want, but this marriage is over. Why would you want to live with a rapist? No, you wanted Bob and you used me for an excuse. No, that's not true. I love you. You better look up the word love. It doesn't include sex with other men. I'll pick up a few of my things and come back next week for other things while you're gone. I'll go to the lawyer first thing Monday and start filing for divorce. Ray, wait! This isn't how it was supposed to happen. Sandy said she forgave you and you would forgive me. I just wanted to get even with you. No, you just had sex with Bob and your sister. I went and got my suitcase, putting a few personal items in it. What do I tell the kids? Tell them whatever you want. I don't care. I don't want to see you anymore. I'll get a lawyer to arrange visits and Amy can take the kids so I can see them. I don't ever want to talk to you again. I opened the door and stepped out. Amy drove me to a cheap motel until I could find another place. On the way to the motel, I told Amy the whole story. She was my sister and best friend. She knew I was telling the truth. I knew she would help watch Deb and the kids. Weeks went by and it was very hard for me. I worked overtime as I had more expenses to pay. I found a cheap guest house that I rented by the week. I ate mostly at a bar or a corner diner. I met with a lawyer and, since I had no proof, simply asked for our marriage to be dissolved. 
He told me that Debbie didn't want it, but would agree to anything I wanted. Everything was pretty much split 50-50. We rented a house and she just took over the payments. Our savings were split in half, and she had to give me half the value of our stuff. I had to pay child support, which didn't bother me at all. I love my children and miss them terribly. The problem was that I also miss Debbie, but I knew it was over between us. I went to every school function I could so I wouldn't interfere with work. Both of our children had birthdays, and I went to them as long as I didn't have to be around Debbie's family. I made polite conversation with Deb, but whenever she wanted to talk about us, I left. I saw my kids every weekend and occasionally during the week, depending on my work schedule. Deb probably called me almost every day up until the divorce. If she wanted to talk about the kids or household chores, I listened. When she wanted to talk about us, I hung up. One day, I stopped by my sister's house for dinner and played with the kids. Amy told me that Sandy was still sticking to her story about me forcing her to have sex. She told me that Deb was torn between what Sandy said and what I said. I tried to explain to Amy that I had no proof, and neither did Sandy. It was just my word against hers, and Debbie believed her. That was what hurt the most. One afternoon when I was at my house, the phone rang. It was the school. They told me that Kyle wasn't feeling well and asked if I could pick him up. Of course I agreed and went to pick him up. He had a cold and was coughing. Debbie taught middle school, and I called her to let her know I was picking up Kyle. She said she would be home as soon as she could. I took Kyle home, put him on the bed, and took his temperature. He had a slight fever, but nothing serious. About an hour later, Deb came home with Kyle. She quickly went in to see how Kyle was doing. As she went in to see him, the phone rang. I wasn't thinking when I answered the phone out of habit. It was Sandy. What are you doing there? She asked. Well, if it isn't a liar. Kyle was sick and I brought him home. Don't worry, you ruined the marriage. I reached down and hit the record button on the answering machine. It was the kind that recorded both sides of the conversation. Is he all right? Why do you care? You separated his parents. Why do you care about him? Look, Ray, this just got out of hand. You knew we were swingers and Bob wanted a taste of my little sister. If you had had sex with me like I asked you to, it never would have gotten out of hand. But no, you came home and started fighting. You told Deb I raped you. And then you made Bob rape Deb. What kind of damn sister are you? Bob never raped her. She gave herself to him willingly. Hell, she'd probably go along with it again if Bob tried. She was drunk and you put all that shit in her head and then stood by while your husband did her. The problem is, Ray, you can't prove it. I told you from the beginning that she'd believe me over you and now you know. If you need to get laid, call me. Tell Deb to call me later. I hope my nephew is feeling better. She hung up and I turned off the recorder. Debbie asked who had called and I told her, your wonderful angel is a sister who will never lie to you. What did she want? I recorded her message and she said to call her back. Well, I'll see you in court Thursday. I guess we can call it a day of freedom. Don't forget to listen to the message, I said as I headed to my truck. After about five minutes, my cell phone started ringing again and again. It must have called me about 10 times before I got home. When I got home, my cell phone kept ringing. Finally, I picked up the phone. Ray, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. I just talked to Sandy and she told me the truth about not being raped. That's good to hear, but it doesn't change anything in my mind. You slept with Bob and didn't even give me a chance to explain. After I told you the truth, you still chose your sister's story, thinking I was a rapist. I want to tell you one thing. I loved you and probably always will. But I also hate you for what you did to our family and for the distrust you harbored for me. On Thursday, I took two days off work. I went to my attorney's office and signed my name to the divorce petition. I wanted to leave before Deb arrived. I was extremely depressed as I headed to the neighborhood bar. I was already setting up my drinks when I looked over and saw Bob walk in. He didn't notice me as I walked up to him and gave him a cold punch. When he went down, I hit him again and again. I got up and started kicking him until he was a mass lying on the floor. I bent over to kick him again when three guys pulled me away from him. I remember saying, I hope you die in hell, and I kept kicking him until I was dragged away from him. The police officers threw me down on the floor, handcuffed me, and took me to the patrol car. This time I was taken to prison. I was allowed to make one phone call, so I called my sister Amy. I told her about what I had done and that she didn't have to post bail. 
It would be too expensive and I was going to serve my time. She cried when I hung up the phone. Debbie came to the prison to see me, but I refused to see her. It took almost two months before my case went to court. I was charged with assault and I pleaded guilty. I was given two years minus time served. I asked Amy to take my few belongings and store them in the basement. She told me that Debbie was feeling very ill and wanted to see me. I told her I didn't want to see her. I know you don't want to hear this, but Deb really loves you. Her family is furious about what Sandy said about you. And there's something else you should know. Debbie never showed up to sign the divorce decree, so you're going to jail a married man. I went to prison, and it's not a place you want to live. It was like a different world. I got into fights all the time. I had to prove myself to almost every group. I wasn't anybody's scapegoat. My cellmate was a life inmate named Killer. I think he came home one day, saw his wife having fun with another man, and destroyed them both. According to the documents, Keeler stabbed them about 80 times. He was hard to recognize. The year before, he had killed another inmate after he started fighting with him. I tried to hold on as long as possible, but the other prisoners constantly questioned me. In the first two months, I was taken to the infirmary twice because of cuts. Fights happened almost daily. I must have paid my tribute because after that I wasn't bothered as much. What's more, Killer even started talking to me. On visitor's day, I decided to go see my visitor. I thought it would be Amy or my father, but it was Debbie. What are you doing here? I asked. She looked so sweet and beautiful. I wanted to hug her, but I was playing angry Ray. Ray, I love you and I've made a lot of mistakes. I brought you some pictures from the kids. They miss you very much and so do I. Tears streamed down her face. Look, I have a different life now. Just take care of my kids and tell them I love them. She handed me some baby pictures. They were their last school pictures and they looked so cute. Ray, I didn't sign the divorce papers. I will wait for you. I don't care how long it takes. I made a terrible, terrible mistake, but I know we can get through it if you still love me. I didn't know what to say. Of course, I felt that I still loved her. I just hated what she had done and the fact that she didn't believe me. I got up and walked back to my cell. I left her by the window and didn't look back. I was working in the kitchen and overheard a conversation about a guy going after Killer for killing his friend. They were going to try to corner him in the dining room the next night. There was no one I could tell about it without being a snitch. I decided to tell Killer. It would make me part of his group. I didn't want to be part of any group, but I couldn't let this man die the next day. Killer wasn't sure whether to believe me. I told him to believe what he wanted to believe. I didn't say anything to the guards, but to him, I guess I was taking a risk. The killer looked me in the eye. He said you can tell a lot about a person by looking into their eyes. He told me to stay away from him the next day. He would control the situation so that no one would know that I had told him about it. I couldn't believe what he had done. He put two thin hardcover books under his shirt, covering his kidneys with them. Behind him at another table sat three of his group. When the prisoner came up behind him and straddled Keeler's chest, he plunged the knife into his kidneys, but of course hit the book. Knives were usually pretty blunt. They pierced the skin but didn't go through the book. Killer's friends grabbed the prisoner and started beating him until the guards came to the table. The prisoner was taken to solitary confinement and Keeler sat down again to finish his dinner. I cannot believe that he remained calm during the whole ordeal. After that day, Keeler talked to me on a fairly regular basis. When we talked in the cell, he was a completely different person than he was outside the cell. Outside the cell, he was as tough as could be. Everyone knew he was the leader of his group. He asked me about Debbie and the children. He told me that he had three grown children, but of course they never came to see him since he had killed their mother. He said that his youngest daughter, Angie, was on his side. She knew that her mother was the cause of the family problems. She wrote to him regularly, but he forbade her to come and visit. He didn't want other inmates to see her and possibly endanger her. I could tell he really loved his daughter. He smiled when he told me she was a lawyer. I told him my whole pathetic story about how Sandy had set me up and also set Debbie up. Do you still love her? Keeler asked me. Yes, I think so. But at the same time, I hate what she did to our family. Does she still love you? She says she loves me, but I can't forgive her. Why not? Look where you are now. You've hit rock bottom, kid. If there was a woman in the world who loved me and said she'd wait for me, I'd be the happiest man in the world. 
What about mistrusting me, not trusting me, and having sex with another man? Hell, you killed a man and your wife for the same thing. And I regret it every day of my life. I regret not giving her a second chance and getting my family back. Don't get me wrong, Ray, don't hold a grudge. It will kill you ever so slowly. He gave me something to think about. Is he right? What would I do when I got out? I had no job, no future, and right now, no family. The next month, I had another visitor. Debbie came back. She smiled at me, and there were tears in her eyes. The kids drew you some more pictures. She put them in the tray, and I looked at them. They showed a picture of Dad, Mom, and the two kids. I guess the kids still saw us as a family. They miss you, Ray. God, I miss you. Will you ever be able to forgive me, and can we be a family again? I promise I'll do whatever it takes. I don't talk to Sandy or Bob anymore after what she did to us. I'm sorry for not trusting you. I thought, she didn't believe me once. So the next time someone says something, she'll probably believe them again instead of me. Deb, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I want to forgive you, but I don't know if I can. Seeing you with Bob, I can't get it out of my head. Did you really like him? No, I hated it. That's why I threw up. When you walked in, I saw the look on your face and I felt sick. I realized what I did was wrong when I saw you. Of course, I could never take it all back. God, I wish I could. I never would have done it if I hadn't been so drunk. I only want one man, and that's you, Ray, the father of our two children. A couple weeks later, I had another visitor. Amy came to see me. Ray, remember when I told you that Deb had stopped seeing Sandy? I was driving by the house and saw Sandy and Bob going into the house. I don't know why they were there, so I kept driving. I just thought you should know. I was confused again. Had Deb lied to me again? I was ready to forgive her and try to make our life work again. I know Amy wouldn't lie to me. I had to find out why Deb was seeing Susan and Bob again. About a month later, Killer and I got to talking, and he said he felt he owed me for what I had done for him. He said he had been a lawyer before prison and had some connections. He was going to see if he could get me out of the parole program. I didn't know whether to believe him, but he never lied to me. It may seem strange to say that about a criminal, but I respected Killer. I often thought about what a good lawyer he must have been. His speech and stature demanded respect. I knew it was best not to ask any questions about his statement. I took him at his word. A few weeks later, I was called to the warden's office where the parole board was meeting. The first person to speak was the prison governor. Mr. Harper, we have a parole application for you. I don't know who you're familiar with, but we've been asked to speak with you. After reviewing your file, we saw that you had a hard time adjusting for the first few months. Is that true? Yes, sir. I guess I wasn't cut out for prison life, but I tried to adapt. If you had gotten out earlier, where would you have lived and how would you have survived? I had to think fast. I knew this was a make or break question. Well, sir, I have a sister who is also my best friend. She and her husband said that when I get released, I can live with them until I get back on my feet. Aren't you married, Mr. Harper? Yes, sir, but we were in the process of divorcing when I was sentenced. At this point, I'm not sure how things are going to work out with him. I'm just trying to be honest with you. We thank you for your honesty. We knew you had broken up, and we wanted to see how honest you were with us. Sir, as for the job, my previous employer said I was a good worker and to come to him when I was released. What are your chances of going back to prison? We don't look our best when a convict we released early goes back in. I promise you, sir, that I never want to see those prison walls again. Go back to your cell, Mr. Harper, and we'll get back to you by the end of the month. Yes, sir, and thank you for at least considering me for parole. I went back to the cell and Keeler asked me how it had gone. I told him what I had told the council and asked him if he had anything to do with it. You never know, but if you're released early, I'll expect a box of cigarettes a week to be put on my account. He laughed. Debbie came back a few days later and said someone from the parole board was in the house. Are you going to be paroled? She asked. What did they want? What did they say? I asked nervously. How are we settling in and will you be able to live there? I told them we broke up, but I'd love to have you back, she said rather nervously. I changed the subject. You told me you stopped seeing Sandy. Have you been seeing her? She's my sister. 
I don't see her that often. I interrupted her. And Bob, have you seen him lately? Why are you asking me these questions? She did look nervous. You can't be trusted. You said you wouldn't see Sandy, but she and Bob were in the house. Did something happen with you and Bob again? Is that why you're worried about parole? Tell your damn lover Bob that when I get out, I'll finish work, and if you're having fun with him in the meantime, I'll take care of you too. Deb jumped up and ran out of the visitor's room. I knew my thoughts were right. I was ready to go back to the same damn situation that had brought me here in the first place. I had no intention of killing anyone. I just wanted to give them a good scare. I called my sister Amy and she came over to see me. I told her about the conversation with Deb and she said she felt really sorry for me. She said the parole board came to see her and she told them I could stay here as long as I needed to. Her husband Kenny was there and he said I was welcome there. Do you know if they called Mr. Parker about my job? Yes, that's right. And he said you could go back to your old job. You were one of the best workers. Gosh, Amy, you've given me hope. I hope I don't get rejected. It won't. They told me that since you have a place to live and a job, you'll probably be released at the first of the month. She began to cry. Amy was right. I got a call saying I would be released next week. I was given the name of the lawyer who would be handling my case. I was to report to the agency first thing after my release. I didn't understand why I had to meet with an attorney and not a parole officer. I was told that the law firm was the one that arranged my release. They were supposed to meet with me, fill out my forms, explain my parole situation, and then send me to a parole officer. I thanked Killer and he reminded me about the cigarettes. I told him they were coming. Honestly, I don't know if he had anything to do with my parole, but it was worth a box of cigarettes a week just to be free. When I went outside the gate, my sister Amy was standing there crying. I hugged her and gave her a brotherly kiss. Welcome back, brother. I walked into Amy's house and her husband greeted me. I realized that I was very welcome there. Of course, I asked about Debbie, and Amy told me after talking to her in jail that she had contacted a lawyer and signed the papers to finalize the dissolution of the marriage. It seems my thoughts about Deb were correct, but now I was a free man. I knew I had to go to Deb's house and make an appointment to see the kids. I called first to make sure she was home. I didn't want any big surprises and to end up back in jail. I tried to explain to her that I wasn't coming over to cause trouble. We could even talk on the porch. I just wanted to make arrangements to see the kids on a regular basis. She agreed to see me but said she would call the police if I started making a disturbance. When I pulled up to the house, my children ran up to me screaming, Daddy, Daddy, you're back! I grabbed them and hugged them. God, I miss them so much. I talked to them for a few minutes and told them to ride their bikes and my mom and I would sit on the porch and watch them. What do you want, Ray? You've made it clear that we're never going to be a family again. We're moving on with our lives. Debbie, these are my children too, and I want them to be a part of my life. I was ready to forgive you, but you lied to me again. You just had to go back to Bob and Sandy. I know what kind of people they are and who they socialize with. Ray, you were in prison and I was lonely. Don't mess with my head! I know you slept together. I don't care who you're having fun with. Shove goddamn Bob up your ass if you haven't already. I'm here to tell you that if I find out that my children are subjected to this perverted lifestyle, I will do everything in my power to take them away from you. Do you understand? This is not just an empty threat. My children mean a lot to me, and I want them to have a good life. Ray, I would never do anything to hurt my children. Already. You ruined our family because of damned Bob. I'm going to make sure my kids stay away from people like that. Tomorrow I will meet with my new lawyer and find out what my rights are. I don't trust or believe you anymore. You showed me your true colors. I left you, but we have two children and I will make sure they grow up in a good environment. I promise you, Ray, I won't get sucked into that lifestyle. Yes, I've tried it. I admit it, but it's not for me or my kids. You'll see. I've changed. I don't trust you, and remember, actions speak louder than words. My kids came over and I talked to them about school and what they were doing. I told them that I was living at Aunt Amy's, but that I would soon find an apartment closer and spend more time with them. I kissed and hugged them goodbye and headed back to Amy's. The next morning I went to the law firm that represented me. Going there felt strange. I hadn't even talked to the lawyer who had gotten me parole. 
I went to the receptionist and pulled out the card I had been given by the parole board. May I speak to Mr. AJ? Brady, please? I have an appointment. I'm Ray Harper. The receptionist smiled at me. A miss. Brady will see you shortly. Please have a seat, Mr. Harper. I asked myself if she said, Miss? Brady. The card said, AJ. Brady, so I assumed it was a man. I was sitting there pondering when a beautiful woman in a dark blue suit walked up to me. She had a smile, dimples, and shoulder-length dark brunette hair. I couldn't help but stare at her as she held out her hand to greet me. Ray Harper, I presume, she said, extending her hand for a shake. I'm AJ. Brady. I know we haven't met yet, but I've been asked to look into your how shall I put this situation, and I've come to the conclusion that you didn't have a fair defense, and we'll talk about the rest. If you'll step into my office, please. Mary, I don't want to be disturbed. Please take messages to all calls and tell them I will call them back. Yes, Miss Brady, the receptionist replied. I followed her into her office. If she had asked me to, I would have followed her into the abyss. She was a very beautiful woman. Well, Mr. Harper, we meet at last. Please call me Ray if you don't mind. I owe you my life and I have no idea why you did it. Mr. Harper. I mean Ray, uh, a good friend of mine asked me to look into your case. Your lawyer let you plead guilty instead of trying to help you. You had a lot of extenuating circumstances that he never mentioned. You had just signed the divorce papers. The person who caused your divorce came to the place where you were. You were not in your right mind at the time. These and other factors would have gotten you a lesser sentence. Of course you committed assault, but the sentence was too harsh. I pointed that out to the parole board, and they agreed with me to some extent. I asked, why Miss Brady? Why me? Who asked you to help me? Can I call you anything other than Miss Brady? After all, I feel like you saved my life and gave it back to me. Look, Ray, I was asked to help you and I did. Is it really that important that you know who hired me? As for my name, I guess you can call me AJ. I became friends with a man in prison. They called him Killer. He told me he would help me get parole. He also told me that he had a favorite daughter named Angie and that she was a lawyer. I wondered if you were the beautiful daughter he was talking about. My new attorney's eyes glistened. She looked at me eye to eye and said, Yes, Keeler. I mean Dave. My father's name is Dave, and he asked me to handle your case. He's never asked me to do that before, so he must have really liked you. I was surprised when he asked, but for my father's sake, I'd do anything. AJ, can I call you Angie? I know we just met, and you're my lawyer, but you're too pretty for me to call you AJ, and I definitely don't want to call you Miss Brady. What does AJ's even mean? Angelina Juanita Brady is my name. Now you know why I chose AJ. Listen, Ray, there are a few things we need to discuss. Would you have lunch with me? I asked. Ray, I don't meet with clients. It's not a date, it's lunch. I have to go to work in a couple hours and I need to eat. If you don't want to call it a date, you can pay for it and call it a business meeting. You do take clients to lunch sometimes, don't you? Angie smiled and big dimples appeared on her face. No wonder Daddy liked you. Yes, I take clients to lunch and eat. Now I'll tell Mary we're leaving and then we can go out to lunch. I watched her get up. She was a very pleasant looking woman. She had looks and character that you don't often find in a lawyer. We went to lunch and went into a very nice quiet restaurant. After ordering lunch, she told me about meeting my parole officer. She said he was a pretty decent person, but I would have to follow the rules and stay out of trouble. I was to meet with him twice a month for a few months and then once a month for the rest of the year. Angie, you know everything about me. Will you tell me something about yourself? Ray, I don't think it would be appropriate to talk to you about my personal life. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, and I love looking at your dimples when you smile. Ray, please, I told you I don't date clients, but thanks for the compliments. She couldn't help but blush. Tell me about your legal education. It's a business. I have a right to know that as a client. She tried to hold back a smile. Okay, Ray, I have a law degree that I got from the university on a scholarship. I've been an attorney for several years now. My specialty is criminal law. Lunch came and we ate. I couldn't help it. Angie was on my mind. Will I see you again, Angie? You'll actually have to come back next week to fill out the paperwork you get from your parole officer. 
Why don't we have lunch again? I'll even buy you a treat. I noticed she softened a little. Okay, but this lunch is just to discuss business. She couldn't help but smile. After lunch, we went back to the office. When she held out her hand to say goodbye, I held it in both of my hands for a few seconds. I wondered what she was thinking. I hoped she didn't think I was some kind of freak. We said goodbye and I told her I was already looking forward to lunch next week. Her secretary took one look at her and smiled. I guess clients don't see their attorneys that often. But then again, most attorneys weren't like Angie. I went back to work and it was really great. In no time at all, I got my work done. I guess it's like riding a bike. You just get on and start riding. Most of the guys I used to work with were still there. It was like they had a newfound respect for me. Nobody was messing with me. The next two Mondays in a row, I had an appointment with Angie. She was trying to maintain a business relationship, but I wanted to learn more about her. On the fourth week of our communication, she told me that we had ended our business relationship. Are you still my lawyer? I asked. Of course, if you have any problems, all you have to do is call me, she said. Angie, I'm afraid I have to fire you. I'm very sorry. What? Fire me. What in God's name has gotten into you? I helped you get out of jail and didn't charge you with anything, and you want to fire me? Yeah, you said you weren't going out with your clients, and I want to have a real date with you. I want to take you out to a real dinner and maybe a dance. I want to really get to know you. I know I'm an ex-con and a factory worker, but I want to get to know you better. I think you do too, because for the last three weeks I could have been making phone calls to get the information you asked for. I think you want to see me too. Ray, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. Yes, I'm a little attracted to you, but... This is all about ex-convicts and laborers, isn't it? You don't think we should be together? No, no, that's not it at all. You're my client, I'm your lawyer. What will people think? Who cares? Just come with me once. If you don't like it, you'll know not to go again. Follow your heart, come with me Saturday night. Look, I know I just got out of jail and I've been locked up for a while. I don't know where this is going, but I want to give it a chance. Oh God, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'll go once. I'll tell you right now, don't try to get me to sleep with you. Oh God, I can't believe I said that, Angie replied. That Saturday we went for a drive. I borrowed a car from my sister. I didn't want to drive Angie in my old truck. She gave me her address and it was a townhouse. I knocked on her door and when she answered, I saw the most gorgeous woman. I know that all men see women differently. In my eyes, she looked stunning and beautiful at the same time. I wanted to grab her and hug her right then and there. I knew I had to be a gentleman, but it wasn't easy. We went to a fancy restaurant and ordered wine and then dinner. After dinner, we decided to talk for a while while listening to music. Angie, tell me about yourself. Where did you grow up? You must have been married because your last name is different from your father's. Please tell me about yourself. You know my life like a book. Ray, my dad and mom didn't get along very well. Of course, you know how that ended. Dad's been in prison for 14 years now. My brother and sister and I were raised by aunts and uncles. I'm the youngest and I was 14 when all this happened. It was very hard on all of us. My brother and sister have never forgiven my father. They love him, but they just can't forgive him. I knew my mom was cheating on him and I told him about it. I argued with my mom, but she said I was just a kid and didn't know what I was talking about. She said that someday I would really learn about life. Then I told my dad about it. Two weeks later, he caught her with another man. I partly blame myself. If I had kept quiet, this might not have happened. Angie, you don't know that. You're not responsible for your mom's death or your dad's imprisonment. They were adults, and you were a child trying to do the right thing. After my father was sent to prison, I decided that I would go to college and try to become a lawyer, and maybe I could help my father get a lighter sentence. That's why I chose criminal law. Of course, there wasn't much room for maneuvering in my father's case. He was a brilliant lawyer himself and told me he was proud of me, but there wasn't much I could do to help him. Have you been married before or is it none of my business? I asked Angie. Both. I wasn't married long and it's none of your business. She smiled at me when she said that. Ray, can we talk about this some other time? I don't want to ruin this evening. I'm having a good time with you. Would you like to dance? I have two left feet, but this will give me a chance to hug you. 
We stood up and I had the band play a few slow numbers in a row. I took Angie in my arms and we twirled into a dance. I held her close to me and breathed in the scent of her hair. Ray, you should know that I don't go on dates very often. Because of the people I socialize with, I have a pretty big distrust of men. I'm just trying to be honest with you. If my dad hadn't sent you to me, I probably wouldn't be here today. I'll send your father an extra pack of cigarettes. Angie, you're the nicest thing that's ever come my way. I'll do anything to make you trust me. If I step out of line, just tell me and I'll back off. When I took her home that night, I kissed her at the door. After that, she just stared at me. She leaned forward and kissed me again. Can I come in, Angie? No, Ray, too soon, too soon, not today. Will we see you again, say, next Saturday? That might be possible. Call me Thursday. I came home a very happy man. We met the following Saturday and the one after that. She told me more about herself. Ray, I want you to know more about me if we're going to keep dating. I'm not going to hide anything from you. I'm not cut out for this. Like I told you before, I've been married before. It was my freshman year of college. My boyfriend and I decided we loved each other, and of course we made love. I got pregnant and we decided to get married. We went to a justice of the peace and he married us. Soon we both realized that our marriage had failed. We were too young. I had a miscarriage, my husband and I talked it over, realized we had made a mistake, and divorced. I kept the last name Brady because my father said I had to do it to distance me from his last name Miller. Of course that was my maiden name. I was so pleased that she finally confided in me. She asked me about my kids and I told her they wanted to meet her. I mentioned that I had told them about her and my daughter kept asking to meet her. Angie, would you like to meet my sister and my two kids? We're having a family barbecue and you're invited. It's next week, Saturday. I knew it would be a huge step for us if she agreed to come. Meeting my family was the first step in us becoming closer. She looked anywhere but at me. I knew she realized this was a big step. She took a very deep breath and looked into my eyes. Then she leaned forward and kissed me. It was the first time she had ever kissed me like that. Pulling away, she took another deep breath. Okay, Ray, count me in. What can I get you? I had no idea what women did at parties like this. I told her that I would ask Amy to call her. When I told Amy about Angie coming to the family party, the number of family members who were going to attend increased. They all wanted to meet the new woman in my life. My mom and dad showed up, as well as several cousins, aunts, and uncles. Angie said she would make potato salad. I remember Amy telling me how sweet Angie's voice sounded when she called her. I think she was hoping something would happen between us. I knew it was. I stopped by Deb's house every weekend to pick up my kids. I would drop them off at Amy's or we would go somewhere. They were fun to be with. I asked them about their mother, but always tried to do it politely. Kyle told me that their mom was dating a man. This worried me at first, but then Kayla told me that it was a school teacher. His name was Pat. He taught health classes and was the soccer coach. I asked Deb about him and she said, I told you I was trying to turn my life around. Pat is a good guy. His wife died of leukemia two years ago. He moved here to start over. He has a 15-year-old daughter and Kyle and Kayla like her. I want to tell you one thing, Deb. Your lies and cheating have ruined our relationship. If you care about this man, treat him right and above all, be honest with him. Don't mess things up the way you did between us. Pat loves our children and treats them well. He knows about you and realizes that you are their father. I hope everything works out for us. I hope I haven't ruined it for you and all the women. You're a good man, Ray, and I know you'll find the right woman. I'm just sorry I caused you so much pain. I said goodbye and drove home. I found a small apartment about a mile from the house where Deb and the kids live. I found a two-bedroom apartment so the kids would have a place to stay when they were with me. I still stop by Amy's a couple times a week, usually to eat, but I like to visit them too. When the day of the barbecue came, I was on edge. I stood outside and waited for Angie to show up. I was greatly relieved when her car pulled up. She smiled at me and held out a bowl. Potato salad and you better eat some, she smiled at me. She looked beautiful. I don't think she could look bad in my eyes. I felt so good when I was around her. I knew I had fallen in love with her, even though we never did more than kiss. Some things you just know. I just hoped she had some feelings for me too. I introduced her to everyone as my good friend. 
When I introduced her to mom and dad, she smiled and hugged each of them. Dad said right in front of her, Don't miss her, Ray. We already love her and we don't even know her. Angie looked at me and smiled. I took that as positive feedback. When I introduced her to Amy, they both looked at me. Ray, I never told you, but I met your sister when I was interviewing people for your parole. I didn't tell you because the subject never came up until now. I never imagined we would become friends. I told you I would never lie to you. That's why I'm telling you this now. Amy and I hadn't spoken since parole until she called me about the potato salad. Is there anyone else you've talked to that I should know about? Yes, Deb, your ex-wife Sue, and of course Bob. I talked to your boss at work to make sure you would have a job. With the people who witnessed the bar fight, and of course the police who arrested you. I did all of this as your attorney. I never imagined I'd fall in love with you. After all, we'd never met. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about all of this, but I really shouldn't have told you about all of this. You were my client, and I needed to find out the truth before I could be behind you. If you want me to leave, please tell me and I'll leave. Leave? Leave? You just said you were in love with me and that's all I heard. I grabbed her and kissed her, then hugged her and introduced her to the rest of the family. I told Angie I'd be back in a few minutes. I had to pick up the kids. They were dying to meet her. When I got back, Kayla came over and introduced herself to Angie. Hi, I'm Kayla. Are you daddy's girlfriend? You're really pretty, just like daddy said. Hi, Kayla. You can call me Angie or AJ. You're a very pretty girl. It's really nice to meet you. Kayla said, come and meet my older brother. He's 10 years old and he's afraid of girls. Kyle, this is AJ, daddy's friend. I saw Kyle shaking Angie's hand. She knelt down to talk to the kids on their level. I could tell by the way the three of them were talking that they were going to become friends. I walked over and joined them. We like her, Daddy. She's so pretty and sweet, Kyle told me, who was not known for being talkative. Again, Angie just looked at me and smiled. The barbecue was great. Toward the end of the evening, I was talking to Angie when Kyle and Kayla came up to us. Dad, remember how you said we were going to go to the amusement park in two weeks? Can Angie come with us? Then when Kayla and I go on the rides, you'll have someone to talk to. I tried to explain to Kyle that questions like that should be asked in private. Maybe Angie had other plans, or maybe she didn't like amusement parks. He looked at Angie and apologized to her. Sorry, Angie, I didn't realize you didn't like amusement parks. Angie started laughing. She knelt down and said to Kyle, Honey, what your daddy means is that you should ask him those kinds of questions in private not me. As for amusement parks, I love them and would love to go there if it's okay with your daddy. Maybe you and I can ride the roller coaster together. Needless to say, we all went to the amusement park and the kids rode everything they could get their hands on. Angie kept her promise to Kyle and rode the roller coaster with him. She also rode the Ferris wheel with Kyle. On the way home, Kayla said to me, Dad, you have to buy a car instead of your truck. You can't expect Angie to use her car all the time because we all won't fit in your truck. That made Angie and I laugh, but the girl was right. Over the next couple weeks, I didn't see Angie much. I had to work a couple weekends and she was busy in court. We talked on the phone a couple times, but it wasn't the same. One Saturday, I picked up the kids and we decided to go to Chuck E. Cheese's. It was a pizza place for kids. Besides pizza, there were all kinds of games where you could win tokens and get little prizes. We were already at the house when Kayla asked me if she could call Angie and ask her to come with us. I didn't want to disappoint her, so I said I would call Angie. I called out, Angie, it's Ray. Kayla asked me to call you. What are you doing tonight? Oh, hey, Ray. I was going out with some friends. Why? Nothing. Have a good time. Ray, you said Kayla wanted to ask me something. Please put her on the phone. It's okay, Angie. Yes, that's something. Please put Kayla on the phone. I could only hear one side of the conversation. Hey, Angie. Dad's going to take Kyle and I to Chuck E. Cheese's for pizza and games. We were wondering if you'd like to come with us. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell him. We miss you too. Okay, bye. I felt sorry for Kayla. I'm sorry, honey, but she already has plans. What do you mean, Dad? She said she'd be here in half an hour. 
She said to tell you that she's going to buy a car so she doesn't have to use her automobile all the time. Yes, Daddy, she said she misses us. That evening, after we returned from a pizza party where the kids each won a half dozen stuffed animals thanks to Angie and her play skills, I took the kids to their mom's house. Angie told me it was time to get to know each other better. We went to my apartment and sat on the couch. Angie, you know I love you, don't you? I wouldn't be here now if I was thinking about something else. I want you to make love to me. I haven't trusted any man in a long time. All I ask is that you be caring and gentle. I don't want to be used. I want to be made love to. We started on the couch and moved to the bedroom. We did whatever we wanted. I massaged her feet, licked the whipped cream off her belly and everything else. We spent half the night caressing, massaging and making love. I felt best when I could hold her in my arms after making love to her. It felt so good to cuddle and hold her against me. It had been so long since I had done that. She ended up staying out all night. I got up before she did and made us French toast. She came out of the bedroom wearing one of my t-shirts. That t-shirt never looked so good, I told her. I couldn't believe how great she looked even in the morning. She took a quick shower and we sat down to talk. Angie, what's next for us? You know I love you and my kids love you and my whole family loves you. What do you want to happen next, Ray? I sound like a lawyer. We've only known each other for a few months and we made love for the first time last night. I know it's only been a few months, but I want you in my life every day. If we haven't made love enough, we can go back to the bedroom and spend all day there. Angie smiled at that remark. Angie, I want you to be my wife. Will you marry me? Tears came to Angie's eyes. Ray, just so you know, I don't take love lightly. I made a mistake once, like I told you before. Yes, I will marry you. I want you to know that I will always be there for you and the kids. I know what you went through in your first marriage. I will always be honest with you and I will never cheat on you. I will expect the same from you. She walked over to me and kissed me very passionately. Honey, what's the matter? You look happy but sad at the same time, I asked her. These are my thoughts about my dad and how happy he will be. Most young girls think about that special wedding day. How they will put on a white dress, how their dad will walk them down the aisle and give them to their husband. I know that will never happen to me, and it makes me sad. She cried softly. Last time, my father didn't even know I was getting married. By the time I wrote him, I had miscarried and was on my way to divorce. I'm sorry, Ray, I shouldn't be thinking about this right now. After all, I'm going to marry the man my father approves of and who I was in love with from the first time I met him. What? You loved me from the beginning. I wanted you from the first time I saw you, but I know you knew that. She smiled sweetly at me and asked me when I wanted to tie the knot. I replied that all arrangements would be on her terms. We both agreed that it would be as soon as possible. I asked her if I could start telling everyone and she said she was going to, so we just needed a date. We decided it would be in two months. For the next few days, I was over the moon. I told Amy and her husband Kenny about it. They were both very happy for us. I needed to tell the kids. I called their house and had them both hooked up to the console so I could tell them at the same time. They both yelled how happy they were and how much they liked Angie. I told them it would happen in a couple months, but I wanted them to be one of the first people I told. I walked into Angie's office and Mary, her secretary, congratulated me. She told me that Angie had already told everyone and invited everyone to the wedding reception. She called Angie and told me to come in. Angie was already waiting for me. When I walked in, Angie was crying quietly. What's the matter, Angie? I called the prison, spoke to the warden, and asked him if my dad could get a day's leave to attend our wedding. He told me that my dad is not allowed to leave the prison under any circumstances. His life sentence means just that. He told me it was out of his hands and there was nothing he could do. I'm so sorry, Angie. I know your father's presence means a lot to you. It's getting worse, Ray. Dad's cancer, although it was in remission, is now back. He has three to six months to live. She started to cry and I pulled her to my chest. I thought, why, Lord? Why did you do this to her? She was a good person and I was really hurting for her. Angie, I've been buying your father cigarettes since I was released. It was a deal I made with him. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. Dad doesn't smoke anymore. He uses the packs of cigarettes people send him to barter with other inmates. You didn't contribute to his cancer. I had an idea, but
but I didn't want to tell Angie about it and take away her hope. I kissed her goodbye and told her I'd see her the next day. I canceled work the next day and went to the prison to see Keeler and the warden. When Keeler saw me, he smiled. You take good care of my little girl, Ray. All I ask is that you make her happy. She deserves so much better in life than what she's gotten. I explained my idea to Killer, and at first he said no, but finally he agreed if I could persuade the warden. Then I told him I would see him later, I had an appointment with the warden. The warden greeted me. Well, Ray, I see you're keeping your cool and getting married. I'm sorry about Killer, but he's a life prisoner and we can't let him out for his daughter's wedding. Warden, are you in full control of the prison and can make most decisions about the facilities? What's your point, Ray? Can we get married on the hotel grounds? We can use the chapel and Keeler can walk his daughter down the aisle. You and Killer's daughter want to get married here? In prison just to have her father around? Is that what you're asking? Yes, sir. She hasn't seen her father in over 14 years and he is dying, as you know. All we ask is to use the chapel to get married. I know that prisoners have been married here before. Okay, Ray, I'll set it up from this side. It doesn't have to be a big celebration. You can only invite three outsiders to the prison besides yourself and your fiancé. I'll let Keeler invite a few of his fellow inmates. You will have to use the services of a prison attendant. I thanked the warden and headed back to Killer. Dave, Killer laughed when I called him by name. The warden agreed with my idea. I'm going back to tell Angie. Thanks, Dave. I know it means a lot to our girl. Dave smiled at me. Ray, write down the number I'm going to give you. I wrote it down for Angie. When you go to the bank, tell Angie to get her birth certificate. The account is in her maiden name. I wrote down the information and told Dave that I was sorry for his illness. Just take care of my little girl, that's all I ask, Dave replied. I went back to Angie's office. She saw the smile on my face and asked what was wrong. You don't mind getting married in prison? I asked. What? What are you talking about, Ray? I told her about my conversation with the warden and that her father would be allowed to walk her down the aisle. She started crying big happy tears. God, I love you, Ray. I told her about the safety deposit box and we went to see what was in it. I'm Angelina Juanita Miller and I'd like to see my safety deposit box. Angie gave him her number and he looked at her birth certificate. He walked us over to the safe deposit box, opened it and left the room. The first thing we noticed was a note from her father. Dear Angie, if you're opening this box, it means you're either getting married or I've already passed away. I hope it's the former. In the little box is your mother's engagement ring. I know everyone wondered where it went, but I put it here for safekeeping. I want you to have it and wear it with pride. Your mother had her faults, but she loved you, and I know she would want you to have her wedding ring. There are also bonds here totaling over $15,000 that will help pay for your wedding. I formalized them before I was sent away. When you see your brother and sister, tell them there's a box for each of them too, if they haven't gotten theirs yet. Only yours has a ring in it. Congratulations and always be honest with your husband. With love. Daddy. Angie and I talked about our wedding. We decided to invite her brother Brad and sister Lisa if they would come. And also my sister Amy. We would invite family and friends to the reception which would be held shortly after the wedding. Angie and Amy spent the next month getting everything ready for the reception. Everything had to be paid extra for since the wedding was so soon, but I wanted Angie to have as much of her dream as possible. Amy said she would use her digital camera and take pictures. Angie and I went to her brother and sister's house. She introduced me to them. They told me they didn't hate their father. They hate what he did. Angie explained to them what the wedding was and why she was spending it in jail. Both Brad and Lisa had tears come to their eyes when they learned that their father was dying. After they agreed to go to the wedding, Angie gave them their bank deposit box numbers. They were surprised that their father had set aside something for them. On the day of the wedding, Angie and I drove to the prison together. Amy and her husband came too, but her husband was waiting for her in the car. When we entered the prison, I had a costume for killer. One of the guards took it to him. I was wearing the tuxedo I had rented for the occasion. Amy went into the room with Angie to help her with her wedding dress. Angie didn't want me to see her until she entered the chapel. I went into the chapel to wait for Angie. Brad and Lisa walked in. Brad was going to be my best man 
and Lisa was going to be Angie's maid of honor. There was a small piano in the chapel, and one of the prisoners was playing some songs on it. The guard brought in five other prisoners who were friends of Killer, Dave, and sat them down. The warden came in with the priest and smiled. He came up to me and said that after the ceremony, they had cake and punch for everyone. For a warden, he wasn't such a bad guy. The pianist began to play, Here Comes the Bride, and everyone stood up. Angie walked through the door, accompanied by her father. Both had tears running down their cheeks. Angie had gotten her wish. Her father would walk her down the aisle on her wedding day. When they were in front of the chapel, everyone took their seats except for our little wedding party. Another guard came in and closed the door. The priest pronounces, Who gives this woman to this man? Yes, sir, Dave replied proudly and sat down. Angelina Juanita Miller Brady, do you take Raymond Michael Harper to be your husband? The priest continued his presentation and then asked me the same question. We made sure he answered, to love and honor from this day forward. That's how we both felt. No one was ever to come between us. We had both had a difficult life up to that point. We knew we would do everything we could to make our marriage work. After saying my vows, I kissed the bride. She then turned around and kissed and hugged her father. We all went to an adjoining room to talk for a few minutes and to eat cake and punch provided by the warden. Brad and Lisa walked over to their father and hugged him. It was the first time in almost 15 years that they had talked to him. There were many tears. Tears of joy and tears of remorse. They knew their father was dying and they wanted him to know that they still loved him. Amy took pictures of Angie and me throughout the service. She also took as many pictures as she could of Dave with his three children. She captured the tears, hugs, and even a little laughter they all shared in that short period of time. She left, and she and her husband took the photos to a 24-hour photo center where they were developed and some enlarged. We said goodbye to Dave and the warden. We thanked him for making Angie's dream come true. As we left, we noticed that Brad and Lisa were still talking to their father. It was a wonderful sight to see. We headed back into town and to the reception. Everyone we invited was present. The first people we saw were Kyle and Kayla, who were jumping up and down when we got out of the car. They ran up to us and hugged us. We walked into the auditorium and were greeted with shouts of joy. My parents were there with tears in their eyes, as was almost everyone who greeted us. Many of Angie's friends were there to greet us. Most of them I had never met. I noticed Mary as she came over and gave us a hug. About a half hour later, Amy showed up with the pictures. She enlarged some of our pictures. She spread them out on the table for everyone to look at. Brad and Lisa stopped by the house to pick up their families. Brad was with his wife and two children. Lisa was with her husband and three children. Both families walked up to Dave's picture and told the kids that this was their grandfather. Amy told them that she had taken four sets of pictures and after the reception, each family would be able to take a set home. There was one for Brad and Lisa, one for Angie and me, and of course one for Amy. I wanted to tell you how incredible Angie looked in her wedding dress. If she had wings, she would have looked like an angel that God sent. To me, she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen, and she was my wife. I think most men feel that way about their wives. We danced and ate and danced some more. To the clinking of glasses, our lips were together most of the night. People I worked with told me I was a very lucky man. Believe me, I didn't need to say that. I knew I had the ring, and I intended to hold on to it forever. For those of you wondering, Deb and Pat did not attend our wedding. It was Angie's day and I didn't want anything to ruin it. Seeing her and her father walk down the aisle, seeing her brother and sister make peace with their father. The family becoming whole again. I will never forget that day. Epilogue. It's been six months since our wedding day. Debbie and Pat got married last month. I was pleased to see that she is really trying to get her life together. My children tell me that Pat is treating them well. I asked about Aunt Sue and Uncle Bob and my kids tell me they moved to another state. I was moved to the day shift so I could see the kids more often and be home with Angie every night. She was pregnant with our baby. Three months after we were married, Dave Keeler passed away. The kids visited him every month until his passing. It was sad, but we had time to tell him about Angie's pregnancy. We told him it was going to be a boy and we would name him David Raymond. That brought a smile to Dave's face. I look back remembering everything that happened. The cheating wife, prison, meeting the woman of my dreams and then marrying her. Now I was starting over and about to be a father again. Not a day goes by that I don't thank God for what I have. 
I thank him for giving Angie and me another chance at happiness. That's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.